All right, my friends, well, I just passed 25,000 subscribers, I think it was two days ago, or maybe yesterday, and I just uh, I want to say thanks. It's, uh, it's amazing to me, and, you know, we hear all these videos, like, I got 100,000, I got 10,000. It's a, uh, I think it's great. I like when people do that. Let me just see out here with Pablo for a second. Um, uh, because, I, you know, I, I think when people have a milestone for some reason, uh, they want to achieve it, and they achieve it, it's good. And, uh, I just want to say thank you for being here. You know, it was March of 2018. I started this YouTube journey. I had no clue. I just remember watching my man, Miles Beckler. I said, down, bud. Yeah, we're going to sit down. And Miles Beckler said, oops, let's not sit in that poop. Oh, man. Ah, there we go. And Miles said, it's going to take time. It's going to take time. You got to post, you got to post, you got to post. You know, a vid he talks about a video a day for 90 days. He, I think he did 120 days. And uh, he said, because you, you'll develop the muscle. And, uh, and once you develop the muscle, you're either going to like it or you won't. But you'll always be better uh, at whatever you do if you do it consistently for three to four months. And I, man, I completely agree with that. I think there's a, a rule of thumb that it takes 21 days for a habit to build and that habit might be stopping to have, like quitting smoking or something like that. And so whatever it is you're trying to do, do it for 21 straight days, and you'll develop that muscle, and you'll be better at doing it for sure. Uh, for YouTube, for me, I said I'm going to develop my muscle from doing videos day in, day out, day in, day out. And it's funny, when I first started, I used to get all elaborate and get my uh, my suit. And tie. I didn't have a jacket on, but tie. And said, come here, buddy. And uh, tie in my uh you know, uh, shirt and tie. And then I said, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. So if you look back at the older videos, it's just kind of funny. My videos have always been longer than the average YouTuber for sure. And my, uh, good boy, my time, it's funny, it's just, uh, you know, when I started, I didn't have power. I was just watching a video the other day when I just got my sling. And I was wincing because I had my swing from, sling from having my rotator cuff surgery. And I, uh, I didn't have Pablo back, though. It's just kind of funny. Now I got this guy who I'm sitting here walking with. Can you see him? Pablo, say hi to the camera. Say hi. There he is, everybody. There's old Pablo. And uh, it's just funny how Pablo is such a, a part of the, the channel now. Couldn't be happier. I mean, literally, for me, sitting out here with Pablo, walking over this lake in uh, the neighborhood across the street, man, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a gift from God, man. There's no other way around it. When I was growing up in Peaks Island, so for you who are new to this channel, you might not know this. What are you doing, bubs? What are you trying to get to? Um, I, was, uh, I was born in Portland, Maine. Raised on a small island off the uh, coast of Casca Bay called Peaks Island. And, uh, hey, come on, Bo. Um, let's, let's sit back down here. And uh, it, it, that was uh, back in the day. In fact, I just read an article from Down East Magazine where they used to say, uh, you know, ne'er-do-wells and uh, bohemian types and artists used to live on that island. They called it Welfare Island back in the day. And that was exactly my parents. My parents were, uh, were hippies from San Francisco, met at... Uh, I think I think they met on a bus. My mom, I believe, was going to San Francisco State University, and my dad was a carpenter on the docks down there in San Francisco. And look, I'm 49 years old. You know, my parents were. Uh, let's just put it this way: that may or may not be the actual true story. I don't know. Uh, you know, because lots of fog, if you know what I'm saying, in people's stories and people's memories, mine included. But that's the uh, story, as I've been understand to believe, and I I know they lived in San Francisco, so I know that's true. Um, and then they moved to Maine. That <laughs> they traveled the uh, the highway, the road. I think they bought some crappy land in in Canada or Maine that they're going to farm off or something like that. They got there and they realized that the land was was just all rocks. You couldn't farm it, and uh, you know they're hippies, man. They wanted to go back to the land. So they rented some crappy house in in Portland, Maine, uh, for you know the beginning uh, when I was until I was born, and then they bought a house on on Peaks Island that didn't have insulation or anything like that. Um, and if you don't have insulate, it's a summer house essentially. So they're going to live in a summer house. I think they bought for five hundred bucks. And uh, yeah, long story short, if you're going to live in Maine, you probably want insulation for sure. Um, and then I think my granddad uh, gave my mom a little bit of money to buy a nicer house that had insulation. And uh, memory serves, we didn't have, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, memory serves, we didn't have, um, I want to say we did have running water, but we had the house, the, uh, we had to go outside to go to the bathroom or something like that. I, I don't really, I was just a kid. I was like, what, one or two or three years old. My first memory ever was mosquito bugs flying all around me one night. 
uh, in the summertime at Peaks and just run in my parents' room saying, there's all these Bob bugs. And my dad said, just get under your covers and they'll leave you alone. And I'll never forget, they, I did that, but look, <laughs> they didn't leave me alone. Uh, they, they, I just remember, it's like, oh, man, that's horrible. So I've always hated mosquito bugs, that's for sure. Uh, but anyway, so then they got a, my granddad floated them, I think, 5000 bucks, and they bought a house on Central Ave in Peaks <coughs> Island, uh, right up four houses up from uh, Cathedral's. Um, St. Christopher's uh, Church right there. That's where I got uh, my first commit, my, my, uh, where I got baptized. Was it baptized or my first communion? I think my first communion was 12. And we used to go skating. I didn't because I didn't have any skates. But people used to go skating um, in the St. Christopher's parking lot because it was just a flat piece of, uh, uh, a flat piece of the parking lot. And it would it'd freeze up. I think my mom at one point was able to go to Goodwill or something like that, or some hand-me-downs, got me some uh, figure skates, and everybody else had hockey skates. And I remember trying figure skates, and I, it didn't do the same thing. It's like, I can't skate like all those other guys, and I was embarrassed, and I never did that again. I, uh, I'll never forget when my, my uh, mom signed me up for a tap dance, but she couldn't afford to buy me tap dance shoes. This is after my dad had left, and, uh, and, and I just remember going there with galoshes, you know, rain boots. And uh, I remember my teacher like, eh, <laughs> okay, and that was embarrassing. I remember going to Boy Scouts in those same boots, actually, and uh, I did it for one day, and uh, we're out in the woods, and I just put my foot up against, you know, I, was, I fell asleep with my feet up against the fire, and one of my boots caught on fire and melted because it's rubber galoshes back then. They're not really, those weren't really winter boots. They were literally rain boots. And, uh, and I just remember that, and basically I had no boots after that. And so I remember thinking, uh, Boy Scouts aren't for me either. Um, because I went out, and I just remember, forget the Boy Scout master says, those aren't really winter boots, they're like galoshes. And what we used to do, um, <laughs> John Heffron does this comedy sketch where you take the Wonder Bread bags. We didn't have any Wonder Bread because my mom didn't believe in white bread, but we had whatever the local wheat bread was. And you wrap those. So you put on like three pairs of socks. You take the bag from Wonder Bread. And you wrap it around your feet. And then you take a, uh, a rubber band to tie it up. And that will go. And then you put your feet inside your galoshes. That's what we used to do. And I just remember freezing out there because galoshes aren't for keeping the, uh, the cold at bay. And, um, and, long as, and I think I even got my socks wet and stuff. So I had to put my feet up against the, the, uh, the fire. And, of course, uh, that's, you know, fire and rubber don't mix, that's for sure. Hey, buddy. Oh, what's up, dog? Look at Pablo. He's such a cutie. I love him. All right, you want to go? He's like, let's walk, Dad. Let's walk, buddy. Um, anyway, so that's kind of me. And, uh, you know, all that stuff was, I remember my, my mom, um, you know, we're going, we needed to get, uh, I think it was like 30 cents or something like that, to get color pencils or color pens for school. And she didn't have it. In a, or, or I don't know, maybe she did have money. She spent on cigarettes, I don't know. But she didn't have the money, and uh, and I just remember going to school as the only kid who didn't have, or the only quote unquote what I thought was the cool kids, because I went to school on the island, Peaks Island School. You, know, you had the the poor kids, and then you had the 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 kind of geeky poor kids, I guess not geeky, but just yeah, you know, just the kids that were living in in, in, in shacks essentially. And then you had the the kids who were, even though we're all poor who weren't as poor as what you thought. And, and and that's where I thought I belonged was the kids who weren't as poor. And it turns out I was just as poor. I didn't want to be thrown in with the kids that, uh, you know, had nothing, that just lived in shacks. I mean, essentially, I, I can't explain it, but it's just one of those things you're like, I don't want to be thrown in with those kids. And I went to school, and I know those kids weren't going to have any money for, um, for color pens. And, uh, and that when we, when I had to, get the color pens i have the money for them i remember just thinking oh everyone's gonna you know, make fun of you because you got you don't have the money for the color pens and also we had a we had the didn't have the money so we got the school lunch the free lunch and what they used to do back then they separate you the free lunch kids versus the kids who had either brought their lunch or the kids who uh they paid for it and so i always went in the aisle the line with the kids who had the free lunch which again were the kind of the uh the outcast, so to speak, and I always felt it was embarrassing. No other way around that. And I feel bad for those kids. And I remember their names actually on top of my head. I won't say, of course, but there weren't that many, but I remember them. And, uh, you know, so you throw in with the, you have to stand in line uh, for the kids who are the, the poor kids, the outcasts, essentially. 
and uh, and <laughs> it's not very pleasant when you're in elementary school to go back and sit at your table with the kids who've already started eating because they got the they got the pay lunch or they brought their own. And that uh, had an effect on me. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, it makes you angry. No other way around that. And then, so finally, my mom moved off the island. My dad was long since gone at this point. And uh, we went to. She met a guy in a a lawyer um, in Cape Elizabeth, Maine, who uh, played a uh, jazz musician, but he's also an attorney by day and he played jazz at night. And he needed someone to take care of him. And I'm telling you this story. I've already said this story a million times, but it, you know, basically every 5,000 subscribers or every, I guess I said a 10, 15, 25. So I'll probably say it again at 50,000 if I ever get that. But anyway, so uh, he, needed, he was an older man. He needed someone to take care of him. And uh, my mom needed someone to take care of her financially. He needed someone to take care of him, you know, in terms of washing his clothes and cleaning the house and whatnot. So it was an arrangement. You know, I'm sure there was no love there, but, you know, it was a good arrangement. But he lived in the, uh, the rich part of Maine, even though he wasn't rich himself. He just had a house, I think it's passed down from his parents, if memory serves. And so we moved in there with him, my, you know, my brother, my sister, me, my mom. And he had one of his daughters living there with her husband. So it was a... It was, a, it was an interesting dynamic. Uh, but that, again, I was a rich kid high school. And I went to Portland High School, which is a poor kid high school, for the first uh, semester of my freshman year. And then I went to the rich kid high school. And I just remember not really being made fun of, but you could, I'll never forget one girl said, oh, blah, 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 like the kids at Portland High School. And then everyone's like quiet and they looked over at me like, well, he's from Portland High School. And then I had a hand me down. I, had the whole, I mean, look, man. It's the story of poor kids in Maine and growing up in America in the 70s, leading into the 80s. You know, so Peaks Island was great. I loved it. You could do whatever you want. You know, we stayed out all the time. But it's just like any place. I mean, you had fights and you had, it was just, it was just a kid growing up, man. You didn't really know you were poor, but we kind of did. Um, and then, of course, not having the uh, free lunch was always, <laughs> was always the proof every day that you knew you were poor. But, all right, but, you know, we had a place to live. You know, we had a place to sleep. We had three meals a day. So I'm not sitting here thinking I was a freaking, you know, Vietnamese boat person by any stretch of imagination. But as an American, we were downtrodden for sure. Certainly white privilege, um, which is what infuriates me when rich white people say white privilege or people of color who came over from other places and start saying, Native-born Americans, just because their skin color is white, inherently have advantages over other people. I just find that to be, well, it's racist and it's silly. It actually infuriates me because no one, I don't know you, you don't know me. So don't, don't judge people, man, on skin color. Just don't. No one's, win, no one's better off for that. So don't do that. Anyway, so when I was, uh, let's see, in sixth and seventh grade, we had to take a boat into school, all right, so we took a boat from Peaks Island into, into Portland. Uh, my granddad bought me uh, tuition, it was like 500 bucks a year to go to Cathedral, uh, Cathedral Middle School. I don't know if they had a high school or not. And I hated it, I hated wearing uniforms. I, I just hate, I hated it since day one. I hated, I've always hated being told what to do. I can't stand it. And even people sometimes in the comments will say, you need to do this. And I just, it, it irks me. It does. I know they don't mean it like that, but I hate it. I've always had. When people say, you need to do this, it's like my mom barking orders at me. And I it really, it gets my, ugh, it gets my blood boiling. I hate being told what to do. Always have, which is weird because I somehow survived in the army. Barely. Uh, but anyway, so uh, then after that, I moved in with my dad um, in Portland. He lived over by the law school at University of Southern Maine. And that was a great year, man. We had cable TV. The first time we ever had cable. First time we ever had color TV. It was flipping awesome. My brother lived with us. And I went to King Middle School. It was fantastic. And uh, I think by then is when I started drinking beer. And I loved it, man. I loved it. Loved getting drunk. Loved beer. Because it totally just got all the... The shame that you've grown up with. And just self-inflicted. I get it, but you still have it. It just made it all go away. And I'll never forget, my dad finally was able to buy me some glasses. And, like, I had my glasses for, like, a day. And I was in eighth grade, 
and we went up to a field party at Nathan Clifford School, which is literally just you know two houses up the street across the way. And I just got drunk as a skunk and passed out on the on the uh, uh, on the field. Woke up in the middle of the night and came home and left my glasses up there and I never found it. My dad was pissed, and I never told him actually and for a while. And so, uh, long story short, about three months later, I was, my grades were suffering in eighth grade. And uh, finally, he said, he can't see the board. And he's like, what happened? I got your glasses. And I remember sheepishly telling them I lost them. I didn't tell him why. I just said, yeah, I did. And uh, he said, <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so then he moved to D.C. when I was in ninth grade. My mom moved into that house. She moved off the island with my brother and sister. So he went to Portland High School. So, you know, I just again, uh, my friends from Peaks and my friends I met in Portland, all kind of ne'er to wells, and uh, we just we just party, man. There's no other way around. I remember just getting drunk, and I loved it. Not gonna lie, just smoking dope, getting drunk. I never dropped acid or anything like that. The horror stories my mom had told me when she was in San Francisco dropping acid. I've never had any desire to do any of that, but you know, engaging in pot smoking, lots of drinking, lots of drinking. So from basically. What, 12, or seventh, uh, 13, I guess that's 8th grade, to pff, essentially when I was 27. I mean, for those 14, 15 years there, man, I was drink. I, I, I loved drink. I loved to get drunk. I'm not going to lie to you. I liked it because you, you know, why do you like that? You, uh, you become a different person. And because of that, it's something very liberating about getting drunk where you can be someone you're not normally. And I was always a party guy. It was always kind of like a life of party but there'd be 10% of the time I was a freaking a-hole. And uh, 10% of the time I was an a-hole was 10% of the time I'd get in big trouble and, uh, and either you know throw fists, get fists thrown at me, say bad things to people that hurt them. And uh, I just, I couldn't be doing that anymore. So fifth, uh, 25 May, 1997, never touched it again. I still think about a pint of Guinness. My wife's got one right now that she's drinking on it. She's making some, uh, uh, some pub pretzels, which, you know, she, she's not like tempting me, but man, I just <laughs> look at that pint again and said, oh, I could easily have a go for something like that. But I mean, I don't look, man, going back to habits, you break a habit after 21 days, you don't really need to go back there. Quit smoking when I was 22. Um, and I still crave a cigarette every now and again, not going to lie. It's just, it's what I, I just crave stuff. I have an addictive personality. I'm addicted to YouTube. That's for sure. Uh, much better addiction than that than other things for sure. Never gotten hard drugs. Marijuana never did much for me. I remember when I was in high school down in the D.C. area in Silver Spring. I went to the biggest high school in Maryland, Blair. I remember uh, we skipped school one day and it came back. And it's funny because I had a, a, a couple of different friends, groups. It was actually kind of interesting in hindsight. You know, I've always been in a metal, so I had some metalhead friends. And then I had some other friends who weren't metal. It's just kind of funny how the, the different friend groups I've always been able to. Um, never got real tight with anybody. Never have been like that. But I've always known people. I just never get real tight with folks. But anyway, some metalhead friends and I. This one guy, I forgot his name. He and I played baseball together. He was a metalhead like I was. And we just loved metal. Freaking speed metal. Oh, man. So he and a couple of, uh, it's funny because he was like a jock. A big guy, Phil. That was his name, Phil. A big guy, and he's a good baseball player. And I was a good baseball player, but man, we both love metal. We both love drinking, and uh, and he used to always have dope, <laughs> so we'd smoke it all the time. And uh, and one and I liked it back then. So one time we smoked it at my house, and I just had this. It was like I don't know if it's a trip or what, but man, it just woo. I said I'm never doing that again. And that was when I was like you know. 11th grade, never did that again, never wanted to do that again. It's literally not true. I probably shouldn't say when else I did it. It was a long time, well before I met Charlotte. It was when I was in the Army. It was the last time I ever smoked dope. And I don't really want to get into that too much, but uh, it's just kind of funny. I never liked it. Always made me paranoid. I just always like alcohol, beer. And I, you know, hard alcohol, thankfully, I never got too deep into. Um, I just like beer, man. And it was like for me, I fear no beer. You know, remember? I don't know if that's uh, like some kind of uh, meme back in the old days before they had memes, but that was me, man. I fear no beer. I love beer. All, I mean, you name it, I loved it. And uh, I remember my dad growing up used to have Narragansett. That was uh, you know, the poor man's beer in Maine. And I gave, they gave me a beer for my first birthday is my understanding. 
and, uh, and I was drunk as a skunk as a one year old and they thought it was pretty funny it shows you kind of the parenting I had for the hippies there and, uh, and I'm sure that ruined or created some kind of addiction I don't know my mom looked back and was kind of feeling pretty guilty about that as well she should but uh, you know, they said I was drunk falling all over when I was one year old or two years old or something like that but just a kid but man, they used to, I used to love, I remember driving with my dad, you know, we'd come back from the D.C. area where he lived and, you know, take us back to Maine, and he'd stop and get a, <laughs> some six-pack, <laughs> and I'd have the six-pack in my hand. I would be drinking, he didn't let me drink it, but he said, hey, all right, open one up for me, and I'd be like, okay, no, like, no clue back then, like, you're driving on the freaking 95 through New York City, should you really be drinking a beer? You know, I was 14 years old, I had no idea, <laughs> so I'd open up a beer. I still have the six pack in my hand. And he's like, all right, thanks. It's just, I mean, this is just, a, it was a different time back then, man. And I miss those times to where people could be real. Now everyone seems like they got to be fake and everyone's so paranoid of everything. Even though the likelihood of disasters happening now are so small and remote. And yet we're even more scared than ever, even though we're safer than ever. It's nuts. I mean, back then, you know, you pack, we didn't even have a car until I was freaking, hell, I guess until I was eighth grade. You know, we didn't even have a TV until I was like eight, nine, something like that. But anyway, I mean, back then, man, people just, you throw all your kids in the back of the, the uh, station wagon. I just, you plug them all back there, everybody be smoking. And I just know, it's just, it was a time back in the 70s where people just, you know, people were just people. You're like, whatever. I mean, it wasn't, I don't know. Maybe it was a word about the the commies or my, my parents' word about Reagan. I don't know. But people just lived without this fear of, oh, my goodness, I'm going to say something that's offensive. I'm going to be cancel culture. I just wish we'd get back to that time where people just be okay. Like, you are you who you are. I'm not going to pigeonhole you because of race, religion, where you grew up, your accent. I'm going to treat you as a human being, an individual. And now somehow that's white privilege to say, I want to be treated as an individual. Crazy. Crazy where we've come. It's not good. But anyway, that's a little about me. My 25,000 subscribers. Appreciate y'all being here, man. It's a, it's a journey. And as you can see now, I take old pops for long walks. Uh, we just did a long one here today. It's pretty good. He's... He's kicking it. He's kicking with it, that's for sure. And uh, I enjoy the YouTube channel. And if, uh, you know, if you guys have thoughts or questions, you want me to talk about something, let me know. I'm not sure why I got a guy moving slowly there with the Georgia Tech tags. Maybe he's looking for my daughter. I guess she's Georgia Tech and she's at home for Thanksgiving. But all right, we'll see you.